Welcome everyone to the Daily Dose podcast. This is the podcast where we pick out things from the news and social media that's interesting to us as entrepreneurs and as business nerds. I'm James and I'm joined by my co-host Marcelo. Hi mate. How are you doing? Good on you. Not too bad, thank you. Um, so we've got a few topics for you today. Um, a couple from Twitter, uh, one from the Financial Times. First up, we've got uh, a tweet which from a little while ago, um, but I think is generally applicable and it's a kind of a, uh, a viewpoint on uh, where you should start with an idea or where you should take an idea. And this is from a guy called uh, Amjad Massad on Twitter and he tweets, there's something really strange that happens again and again in technology. Things that, that are built to be general from the start fail to gain traction, while those that are built for specific use cases generalize over time. The web is a great example. GPT is, the, is another one. Uh, GPT there being the uh, AI uh, learning model that we talked about a while ago. Um, and in a previous podcast, we also talked about um, bundling and unbundling, which I think has a, uh, is kind of in the same ballpark here. And also actually from programming, being a programmer, they, you can, there's, there's a concept which is kind of like uh, premature abstraction, which is basically where you are trying to solve a specific problem and whilst you're solving that problem you get the idea for oh, actually this could be generalized into something far more broader um, which is in general is a good thing when you're doing programming because it's it means you can reuse it and it could be more applicable in other cases um, but you don't really know enough about the problem space at that point to be able to generalize properly and it's not until you've seen two or three different takes on the same specific takes on the same topic or the same problem that you are able to actually successfully generalize it into a more something that's more generally applicable. What you tend to find is you'll program something which uh, you think will completely sort of solve this class of problems. Um, and all of a sudden something, a different class of problem you hadn't even considered will come along and blow it completely out of the water. Like it's the, the programming equivalent of a black swan event. Right. Um, and I think here, this guy is, is, is correct in stating that it's the same with um, ideas and, and business models and things like that. It's um, if you have this cunning idea for something and you try and aim it at everybody or a wide range of things, then it's not specifically applicable to any one smaller area. And so there's less reason for any one uh, person with a problem to pick your thing over something else. And if you look at what are now very general technology platforms, so he gives the example of web and the GPT, um, but there are other ones. So if you look at things like uh, Facebook, uh, quite famously, you know, Facebook's growth came from the land and expand model, which is where it was, it was essentially hot or not for a single university campus, which then expanded into other university campuses. Uh, and then, and then they so they started quite specific and solving a specific kind of problem in it for a specific group of people and built technology applied to that and then realized well actually this technology and this set of functions applies far wider than that so let's let's build out from there and you know part of the reason you could say for their success was the fact that they were able to sort of build on previous successes rather than trying to be the total global social network from day one which means that, you know, network effects don't kick in if you try and, you know, if you get an individual over here from India and you get an individual over here from China and you get an individual over here from America, it's like there's no network effects, no groups. Whereas if you corner the market in Harvard and then corner the market in like the Ivy League uh, universities and then corner the market in colleges in the US in general and just keep expanding, 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 then you can build something general out of something specific. And that pattern repeats itself often enough that it feels like it's probably kind of, you know, an axiom of um, startups and technology products that that, that, that is actually true. Um, there, there are obviously, there are counter, counter examples to it at the same with any good rule. You know, there are counter examples that prove or disprove the rule, but um, have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And also Amazon is another example. They started selling books and now they sell, pretty much everything so um but uh, it was not the plan even amazon they don't operate in every single country they are very selective with that they operate in um well at least their retail like their uh, marketplace it, it operates in five countries i think so um i think um 
yeah, as you were saying, uh, you, you need to solve a problem. So then that problem should be finite, finite uh, as well as a solution. Um, then you can, it's easier to grow it. Um, so, but I will also probably point out that there is another uh, limitation, which is uh, the cost of customer acquisition or your distribution cost. We talked in previous episodes about the, the importance of distribution. So if you are trying to sell something that it's too broad, it will be too difficult to explain um, and therefore it will be way too costly as well. As well. So uh, people, you will struggle to tell what all this about if it does too many things, you know. Uh, and also you cannot narrow down your audience. So then you, you need to go just you you will overpay and it will not work and it will you will struggle to communicate what it does and also uh people nowadays they they have they are bombarded with way too much information so um you need to be very specific on what are you putting out there um and after they get to know you gradually yeah you can grow it from there but i think uh, yeah the uh, ultimately, like companies are group of, groups of people trying to solve problems, um, but uh, users um, attach to brands, or which is similar to a story. So essentially, we are hardwired to understand the stories. So if the story is complicated or it's not clear, then um, you, you will struggle to to, to uh, attract attention and drive users to your yeah project yeah i uh, another tweet which uh, caught my eye which i think is kind of related to um ideas and proving out ideas and building products and you know maybe specifically to building generalist products versus specific products and land and expand and things like that um there's a guy on twitter called arvid carl um, who's been doing the rounds of a lot of podcasts and things um, of late. Um, and he was tweeting about this idea of validating and building and in which order you should do that, which is a very classic, uh, particularly sort of SaaS um, problem, but is actually, you know, quite a, a problem that's applicable to more than just sort of technology businesses. It's kind of like, if you're going to build a business, do you invest time and effort in building the product or service or infrastructure and then go out and validate it in the market or do you try and validate it first and then build to the validation that you've already done and the temptation again as as like uh, company builders or um, people starting startups programmers creatives of many different sorts is to get involved really early into deep into the weeds and actually building uh, the products so if i'm a programmer I, I want to be building the infrastructure i want to be building the website i want to be building the back end the app the databases and all the lovely bits and bobs and then so many times you know i've done this personally and i know many other people that have done it as well is you know you come up with this amazing idea create spend time and effort creating this amazing thing and then take it out to the market and they're just complete silence crickets and you then have this massive slog of like well is it because nobody wants it or is it because i'm marketing it in the wrong way or am i not you know going after the right group of people is there a different group of people um I, the blame for this, I think, falls squarely. Well, it's probably human nature in general, but like um, the Kevin Costner movie, Field of Dreams, which is where you get the classic build it and they will come, you know, where he gets told by a magical baseball ghost that if he builds his uh, baseball stadium out in the cornfield, then all the ghosts will turn up and play baseball. Um, this is the same, you know, pe people just think like, if my mouse trap is good enough, then people are going to be, you know, knocking forging a path to my door to try and buy, buy this better mousetrap um and it goes against all of your best all of your instincts but you've really really got to try and um concentrate on as much as narrowing down what it is that your product or service might be that you actually find a market and find the group of people who might have that problem in the first place now there's there's two angles two different ways of doing this one is you can have a an amazing idea and then you spend time and effort going out and finding, okay, who exactly are the group of people who might you know, benefit from that idea? Can I reach them relatively cheaply, profitably, based upon what it is that I'm going to be charging for this product or service? And then once you've validated your marketing, your sales, your um, pricing, 
then reverse and start building out the thing and then bring it to market. And then the completely other direction of doing it is you actually, you go out and you find an, or without an idea in mind, you go out and you find a community of people or an audience um, and, you know, get to know that audience, wherever it is they might meet, be, be it online or on some community groups or wherever it might be, learn about what their problems are, talk to them, try and discover, is there a consistent set of problems or something like that, which would be amenable to some sort of product or service. And you then generate the business idea or the product or the service idea out of a pre-existing, pre-existing audience of people, which you already know about, you already have connections with, and you know, you already know how to reach. Uh, that is less appealing to the sort of inventor mindset, the tinkerer mindset for sure. Um, but is, is actually a pretty successful way of doing it because you are pre you can never completely take risk out of the equation. You know, your products could always fail, but if you go in having ticked off, I can reach an audience, I can reach them profitably. And I know the pricing that I can sell them to. And I know that I am able to produce my widgets or services or whatever it is for less than that is that I'm selling to them. Then, you know, the 80, 20 is that you're going to be successful. Um, Have you had any experiences with, these kind of build it before validation or validation before building either either way uh yeah a lot um, um by failing as well so um and lesson learned so actually so it's um you will fail uh when starting companies um so that's that's for sure um but it's better if you learn from other ones someone else's mistakes so um <coughs> Sorry, it will be less costly at least. So uh, you should do your research, which is basically what you were saying. Uh, and uh, you will be surprised uh, many entrepreneurs don't do that. So you should, uh, first of all, identify who, if, if there's any others out there, what are they doing? Um, how you compare or differentiate from them? Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, also... Maybe there is no one out there doing that. And that, that's not necessarily a good thing. That could be a bad thing uh, because it may mean that it's not uh, feasible or uh, you know, e- e- economically viable. Uh, so, uh, so also, maybe there is not a company at the moment doing that, but there was before. And they failed. So you should, um, yeah, you should uh, take your time, research, um, and for sure uh, try to test the market or the audience first. Um, that's highly recommended. Yeah. Um, of course, it depends on the products um, and on your circumstances. So how much money would you have to, you know, uh, uh, buy advertising dollars? So, um, for how long, etc. So, um, yeah, how much time do you allow yourself or your business to um, to be, you know, uh, losing money or not making money? Um, so all those factors will influence a lot. Uh, maybe you have like a very long term uh, plan on something that you are doing as a side business. Then. Uh, over time, probably, yeah, you, you, are, you are most likely to get there. But if you don't have much time or much budget, which is usually the case, uh, the best would be to do your research or test the market. Just offer the products uh, or a mock of the products or, or whatever um, without having it and see if there is demand uh, in social media for free. Uh, and then if there is, you can tell them to pre-order or this or that and, and go build it. Um, yeah, hopefully at a profit. I would, I would, as, as a piece of advice to anyone who's kind of pre starting, uh, I would choose, um, your path based upon what your inspiration is or where, or where your interest lies. If you're primarily motivated by making money and you're inspired by making money. And so you're less kind of wedded to either a market or a product idea. Uh, then I would definitely go community first or audience first. In other words, find the group of people, work out what their problems are, and then develop products and services for them because that's the, that's the most solid path. 
if you are inspired or passionate about a particular audience or a group of people, then again, take the same path, but do it because you are motivated by that group. You're, you might already be doing that as a hobby or it might be people you already sort of get along with or something like that. And so that makes most sense. <clears throat> if you're most motivated by the product or the idea or the inspiration or creating like an inventor sort of tinkering, then I would take the approach of flesh out what your idea is just on paper and then go away. And as you suggested, do your research, find the audience, find the market and do your validation at that point. So, so for the first two, it's like backing products and services out of an audience. And for the second one, it is validating an audience for a just paper idea that you've come up with before you start coding anything, before you start creating anything, before you start spending too much money. That's, that's what I would say there. Yeah, another um, shortcut maybe that could be useful uh, for entrepreneurs that, I'm, uh, that I have used as well is, so once you have the idea on what you want to build, uh, first just uh, exchange that idea with your, okay, uh, inner circle, but it, there needs to be, those would need to be, maybe it's not your friends uh, that you need to talk to, you need to talk to uh, people that know, that have at least built a business before in that industry. And um, so that uh, ideally the order will be people you know in that industry, friends or, or colleagues or whatever. Uh, then um, a better uh, feedback probably or a more qualified feedback would be entrepreneurs. So someone who is an, or, or has been an entrepreneur, uh, especially if it's in that industry, that, that's a qualified opinion um, then after that if you if your idea is still standing um, then go create a pitch deck and start talking to investors because all these vcs they have their own teams doing research and they know a lot so that's what they do for a living uh, professionally so uh, after you pass the first filters uh, through like qualified feedback from entrepreneurs and, and criticism so if it's still alive uh, then you go present it to VCs, to some of them. Just don't burn all, all your uh, options uh, right away. Just don't yeah, uh, talk to too many of them. But uh, talk to, I don't know, five or, or, or even less. So and tell them your idea and, let's, uh, and from what they tell you as feedback, um, you will get, after all that, you will get a pretty good impression if you have something there or not. Uh, and then, yeah, you can take action accordingly on what are your next steps. Probably test the market. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, next on our list, um, this is possibly opening a can of worms. Um, there was a particular piece of cryptocurrency news which caught your eye this week. Uh, yeah, so I'm a big, big fan of crypto in general, uh, although I didn't make... Uh, money with it unfortunately <laughs> I, I was mo mostly curious on on the tech when bitcoin bitcoin i, I think i bought at 200 dollars, but then just for testing the technology um, but i don't regret so I, I i don't know how to gamble on that so um there is this article though today in the financial times saying that uh, it's speaking about uh, ripple so with 16 billion in cryptocurrency ripple attempts a reset and essentially what they're saying is um, that the startup is still trying to find, a compel uh, find compelling uses for the blockchain technology uh, that they built. And they, they are trying to become the Amazon of the cryptocurrency world uh, by essentially adding, adding uh, more uses uh, beyond cross-border payments. So here, uh, the million dollar questions that has been, it has been open for a while is, uh, do you think uh, like blockchain or cryptocurrencies in general will be uh, globally adopted or will definitely take off at some point? Because the narrative has, has been changing quite, quite a, a lot. So uh, initially what Bitcoin was seen as, as a payment revolution. Uh, uh, but then nowadays there is more of the concept of storage of value uh, because it's not very efficient for transacting. Um, uh, so what, what are your thoughts on this? I have some, some stuff there. <laughs> yeah, can of worms, as, you, as I said. Um, I, yeah, my, I don't hold any crypto personally. Um, I, I'm not a particularly sort of gambly type 
person when it comes to things like that. I don't bet on sports or play poker or do any of that kind of stuff. But um, I think that, that, that I'm not saying anything particularly new here, but there's definitely sort of two, two chunks to crypto, right? There is the currencies as a thing, as, a, as an idea, and there's the underlying technology. And one enables the other, but I think that all the technology associated with blockchains, i.e. distributed trust, goes beyond currencies. And I, so in terms of mass adoption of blockchain, I think that is just, um, just going to happen over time. More and more use cases are coming out all the time. The underlying technology associated with it is quite robust. Even if any one particular implementation of it um, may or may not win out over another one, um, the ideas behind it and the sort of general implementation details of it just make a lot of sense because it just removes a whole class of friction from the financial um, services industry. Um, essentially, all of a lot of the services that uh, large banks and financial institutions provide to the financial services industry um, that are effectively like rent seeking um, things like uh, custodian. Um, trust transactional any of those kind of things you know where they're sort of charging and taking five to ten percent of transaction volumes or they're charging sort of significant chunks of whatever the money movement is going on can be achieved via blockchain for you know fractions of a percentage and you just know anyone that anyone who wants to carry out those kind of transactions is going to go to where it costs less to do it as long as it's trustworthy and you know just it's just a, a different class of um, quality of product in terms of, you know, it, from on a pure commodity basis, do you want to go over there and pay 10 times as much for something? Or do you want to go over there and pay, you know, one times as much for something? So I think the general move towards the, you know, the use of blockchain technology will continue over time. Uh, you know, banks themselves are looking, uh, you know, even today are implementing back office services using blockchain on their own thing. They're still going to try and sell it through the old, kind of systems and for the old markups but you know there's one of the banks is going to break ranks and say no i know actually let's drop our price slightly and so over time it's going to you know the prices of all these things are come going to come down to the point where it's just going to be the commodity value of whatever the blockchain is from a currency perspective yeah i think that's a bigger question and i think you're right like bitcoin is bitcoin in particular has very much become as you said like a store of value particularly over the last but particularly because of the financial crisis of 10 years ago and the current sort of pandemic crisis, you know, the, the central bank solutions to the sort of financial problems that all of that causes is quantitative easing, which is the, you know, massive printing of money, which effectively, you know, mass devalues uh, currencies, particularly the US dollar as, you know, the, the, the world's currency, so to speak. So if anything that you're holding as an asset that is, you know, valued in US dollars or in or in neat cash is just going down in value over time. Whereas Bitcoin, because of constrained supply, just will retain its value as as long as people believe that it's worth what it is worth. And you know, that's the same as any fiat currency. You know, most currencies in the world, if not all currencies in the world, are fiat currencies these days. You know, it's not backed by assets. Bitcoin isn't backed by assets. There's enough um, money uh, being transacted on that platform that I think you know trust can be there also it's a very volatile uh, currency but that's not necessarily a bad thing um over longer times it makes it more sort of speculative gives reason for people to do transactions on the platform um so yeah <clears throat> i don't have a crystal ball to say which of the uh, currencies may or may not sort of succeed and i think probably although you know money solves a number of different purposes for us you know as as humans um there is the store of um, value and there is also the transaction, you know, exchange of value. And those are two different things. So I think, you know, it may well be the case that different cryptocurrencies achieve, you know, uh, primacy for each of those different things. So maybe Bitcoin could be the eventual sort of global uh, store of value. And then another uh, cryptocurrency could be the global transactional instrument who knows you know it will be dependent upon what the sort of underlying rules of the cryptocurrency are um 
I think the longer that it exists, the more trust there will be in it, the more likely it is that this will come to pass. I think the only thing that could knock sort of crypto off its perch is if one of the main major crypto currencies suffers some like mega um, encryption attack or there's just some deep rooted failure of the algorithm, which no one has been able to determine as yet, but some, you know, someone some evil mastermind with a volcano lair and has got, you know, supercomputers working on it, works out a flaw in some of the encryption algorithms and all of a sudden, you know, <clears throat> away you go. I, the, the chance of that happening gets less with time. Although obviously with the ramping up of computer power, who knows and quantum computing, who knows? Um, but yeah, so I think, I think it's blockchain as a technology for sure. Um, store of value, cryptocurrency, probably, Transacting money, cryptocurrency, not sure. Because if I think you have to have, for a transacting currency, I think it needs to be inflational, um, which is the opposite of what if is a store of value. Well, um, yeah. So yeah. Anyway, that was, that, that was my take on it. On, on the transaction side, um, so I have uh, experience on, on FinTech, as you know, on, on this, uh, uh, my, my previous company, or. Uh, that is still uh, around, but the thing is, um, the Facebook tried to uh, launch a stable coin, which is uh, an interesting concept. Basically, it's a basket of current cryptocurrencies li linked. Well, actually, it was their cryptocurrency, uh, Libra. Uh, um, a link. It was um, correlated, let's say, uh, with a portfolio of other fiat currencies uh, to keep it stable. Uh, so, so you can so to be less less volatile and and, and liquid, let's say, um, and allow cross border payments with almost no fees, maybe zero fees. So uh, then, uh, and here is why I think uh, crypto will struggle because of regulators. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, if they manage to crack down Facebook, even even before they launched, uh, and I I seen that by being involved into a peer-to-peer -peer lending um seen uh so, so regulators they have you know the power of the pen they can wipe out companies out of existence just by because they they decided that yeah it's either risky or 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 they just don't want um to um, they, they are, they, they let central banks, by definition, they want to centralize decision making. Uh, so they don't want all this decentralized stuff. Um, so I don't think uh, from a financial point of view, it will take off the cryptos uh, as a payment method, unless there is, um, what it can happen though, and, and probably I think China is attempting to, is that maybe the fiat currencies will be digitalized, but it will not be decentralized. It will still be the central bank issuing it. And to the, the counter argument that fiat currencies are backed by nothing, the counter argument to that is that they are backed by the taxpayers. So uh, given uh, in the US, people will need to pay their taxes in dollars, then there will be demand for dollars. So if you, if you, on top of that, so if you have, if the U.S. has a, you know, a productivity ratio or like a GDP of X, then there will be, you can expect a demand of X amount of dollars, and that's why if there is demand, there will be value. Uh, but but also if you all consider the debt that many other countries have in U.S. dollars, then they will need as well dollars to pay back their debt. So, well, China China now is is is, is um they have issued debt to many countries. Um, so, so their currency, I mean, as they trade with more and more countries, that currency ca could potentially challenge the US dollar as the uh, most widely used in the world. Um, we'll see that. Uh, so so I, I think crypto is not gonna, um, it's not gonna replace yet, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, because of regulators. Uh, unless there is a super big change, uh, like uh, uh, like a worldwide agreement, uh, but even even with that, it will be difficult. Um, um, and then on blockchain, um, I, 
I think uh, it's very linked. So if, if, if cryptos are not globally adopted for the day to day, then that puts a cap on the financial use of blockchain. Maybe as a storage of value, that's fine, but, um, but probably it could be used for something else. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to see if there is any breakthroughs on uh, all the, um, um, probably like a, like a digital ID that can replace like passports and all that. Uh, so it can speed up like, you know, travel or also maybe voting. Uh, you can vote safely and digitally. Um, and there are yeah, many- blo- blo- blockchain is uh, distributed uh, decentralized ledger, right? So anywhere you need to truthfully and trustfully record things um, with cast iron trust guarantees, any, anywhere where there are services or products which need those things, then blockchain works really well at scale. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to yeah, uh, any more applications on that. Uh, as for Ripple, uh, well, as the article says as well, they made a lot of money, the founders, but it's still uh, lagging behind. On, I mean, it's still a major cryptocurrency, but it's, it's not transacting a lot compared to the peaks they had uh, earlier on. So, yeah, let's see. Uh, I mean, I encourage uh, all of those companies um, yeah, to keep pushing. Um, yeah, I, I will be always there, uh, fan and use uh, user of, of all the products. So, um, yeah, and also I think um, as new generations uh, come in, they will be more and more inclined to use all these digital products. Um, it's fair to say as well that some uh, fintechs or digital banks uh, are catching up very quickly, um, on like Revolut, TransferWise, they're doing a great job, Monzo, etc. There are many other in the US. So, um, yeah, I mean, if, if they become radically better, as they say, than, than banks, then that, again, the, 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 creep, the margin for demand on crypto would just won't be there, probably. But that's it. Yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's a friction problem. I think if they, if whoever can solve, if, if, a company or a group of companies or whatever it might be, you can come up with a way of allowing you to exchange stroke earn stroke transact this easier than cash for the average Joe on the street. Then, you know, then, then, then the part that is downhill, you know, it's a, it's a slippery slope down then into like using it on a regular basis while it's, while there's more friction than using cash or, you know, our, our current forms of payment, then, then that that's that's where the tipping point is going to be. I, I don't see it being as there in the next two or three years, but we, you know we'll see if that comes along. Um, yeah, exactly. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. We'll be back next week with some more nuggets of knowledge. In the meantime, please do check out our YouTube channel, which is where we post this and our other podcasts. You can search for Networkers, two words. Uh, you can find the link in the show notes as well. If you're interested in a deeper dive into all things entrepreneurial, including more detailed information, help, mentorship, and courses please do check out our website and that is at networkers.co. See you all next time. Thank you. Bye.